This video is about 2D conduction, especially about some estimates and approximations that we can obtain in steady state. So first, let's see what is the objective of solving uh, n-dimensional conduction analysis problem. In the case of uh, steady state conduction, the equation that we are solving is the Laplace equation. The same equation, del square t equal to zero, occurs in momentum, heat, and mass transport. So this has a special form, which is uh, the solution of which is uh, equation is linear. And there are some special solutions to this. In case of conduction, this is the exact equation that we have to solve. And what is the purpose of solving uh, temperature uh, profiles? So once we solve this, we obtain the temperature profiles and we can obtain the heat fluxes. So remember that the uh, heat flux uh, is K times grad T. So at any surface, suppose we want to estimate the heat flux, we need to find temperature profile and then take its first derivative. In the case of 1D, it is K times partial T by partial X. So these are the uh, uh, usefulness of getting the temperature profile. Now, once we obtain the temperature profile, we can also get other useful things such as the maximum and minimum possible temperatures. Normally, we may not know uh, what is the maximum and minimum possible temperature. Suppose there is some limitation of some application of uh, maximum or minimum temperature. By solving this equation, we'll know where where this particular uh, maximum or minimum occurs and how to minimize it or maximize it. Similarly, by integrating this flux over an entire su surface, we can get the heat, total heat rate. Once we solve for the temperature profiles, we get the temperature uh, distribution in the entire two-dimensional or three-dimensional domain. Of particular interest is what is known as the isotherm. Isotherms are lines of constant temperature. So in this problem, what we see here is this surface is adiabatic and so is the bottom surface adiabatic. The left-hand side surface is maintained at temperature T1 and the right is maintained at temperature T2 less than T1. So if, the, if we solve for this two-dimensional conduction problem, we can get the temperature profiles. But of particular interest is this isotherm. So along this line, the temperature is constant. The implication of that is that what is known as heat flow line. Heat flow line shows the direction of heat flow. And heat flow lines are always locally perpendicular to the isotherm. To see why that happens, consider a very um, closed isotherm. That is very infinitesimally there, two uh, isotherms are very close. Then we can we know that the local heat flux occurs in the direction of maximum change in T. So the maximum change in T occurs along the perpendicular direction. And therefore, the heat flow is also along the perpendicular direction. So in general, if you have a set of isotherms and if you have heat lines, heat flow lines, they will all be locally perpendicular, they will intersect at right angles. Um, even if we don't solve the actual set of uh, equations, which is given by this Laplace equation, in many problems, it is possible to obtain a guess profile for this isotherm and that not only helps in giving as an intuition about problems which may solve later, but also uh, provides us a validation. Suppose we solve the exact numerical problem by guessing, we might be able to validate uh, whether we what we got is uh, makes sense or not. So how to do this um, guessing of isotherms and heat flow lines? This particular uh, section is not discussed in sixth and seventh edition. So if you go to fifth edition of in Cropera, you will find this graphical analysis of uh, getting isotherms and heat flow lines. So consider a two dimensional problem where 
inside there is a, a hollow rectangle inside of which this surface is maintained at a temperature t1 and the outside surface is maintained at a temperature t2 so it is desired to obtain the temperature profile in this marked shaded domain the first thing to do is to identify symmetry planes symmetry planes or lines in 2d are lines planes about which there is some symmetry in the case of this two dimensional square grid we have eight such regions which are symmetric this and this are identical this and this are identical this and this are identical these both are a mirror image however there is some symmetry so it's a mirror image symmetry or exactly identical surface so if we solve or if we guess the profile in this section alone then it is good enough that we have guessed profiles in the entire domain so first what we have to do is to identify this symmetry planes <clears throat> by definition a symmetry plane means that these lines are adiabatic surfaces why is it adiabatic adiabatic means there is no uh, norm uh, flux in the normal direction so what does it mean that the temperature gradient along this perpendicular uh, direction is zero why should it be zero because it is symmetric so the temperature on this side and on this side of the plane are equal and therefore partial t by partial n is zero so adiabatic uh, the uh, symmetry lines are essentially adiabatic what we have done here is to extract it the small region and expand it here so this shows the normal uh, to this uh, surface where it is uh, adiabatic that is there is no temperature gradient along this line so there is no heat flux along this and this is another symmetry plane which is bottom here there is no heat flux along this and the left side is maintained at a temperature t1 and the right side is maintained at a temperature t2 if we are able to guess the temperature profiles here then we have actually solved for the entire domain firstly we identify the constant temperature lines which is essentially the boundary condition so here it is t1 and here it is t2 the one way to guess the temperature profile is to uh, recognize this condition that the isotherms will be perpendicular to the adiabatic lines adiabatic lines are lines in which there is uh, no flux so this is also a um, condition of uh, flux line so these both the isotherm and the adiabatic line will be perpendicular so let's take first guess so it starts perpendicular here and it has to end perpendicular here so they meet somewhere there so this is a guess we don't know whether it turns there or it turns there but it's just a guess then we go to the other end and guess the it's locally perpendicular there and locally perpendicular there then you bisect it you get one there then there and there so this is a good guess to start with the temp isotherms are locally perpendicular at the surface and locally perpendicular at the surface so these temperatures start from t1 less than t1 and it uh, gradually decreases up to the value t2 we don't know what these values are but these are just some arbitrary temperature profiles the next is to draw heat flow lines now we know that the heat flow lines are locally perpendicular to the isotherm so we can start with some line here which goes locally perpendicular and then reaches here so remember that here it has to be perpendicular to this because this is also an isotherm this is also an isotherm so everywhere it should start perpendicular 
and end up there. So let's take a guess. So this starts here perpendicular, goes perpendicular to all of them, and then finally to the outer boundary condition. Similarly, then let's do one more at the bottom. Here it is very straightforward, almost parallel to the bottom surface. Then go to the middle and so on. So by this way, what we have is a set of guessed, guessed values of the temperature profile at steady state. And from the temperature profile, we can also guess estimate the heat flow lines. There is also a method to estimate the total heat flux, but uh, we leave uh, that. If those who want to know those graphical details can refer to the fifth edition of Encropia. Let's consider another two-dimensional problem where we want to construct an isotherm. So this is a two-dimensional, that there is no symmetry plane here. This is a two-dimensional grid. We have four edges, one, two, three, and four. In three of the edges, the temperature is zero. This is some dimensionless temperature. So we're just taking the dimensionality, uh, dimensionless temperature to be theta. Theta goes from zero to one. So theta is zero in all the four, uh, all the three edges and one edge, it is zero. So how do we uh, start with the uh, guess of the temperature? of the isotherms. So recognize that this U-shaped is also an isotherm. So it's 0, 0, 0. So it entirely is an isotherm. So uh, let's say we want to guess something which is slightly above 0. Let's say 0 0.01. So how will it be? So that will start somewhere there and probably go close to this and then go there. That's a guess because this place and this place are boundary condition, it has to be maintained at zero. So this is a guess we have now that temperature at zero uh, theta equal to 0 0.1 is this. It's a guess, we don't know. Similarly, we can keep guessing the other surfaces and we'll end up at something like this for the isotherm. And then we can draw the perpendicular lines, which are the heat flow lines. So this problem is one of the problems which we'll be solving in tutorials using a numerical method. And you can use uh, analytical solutions of this uh, problem, which is exactly available to compare your um, and, uh, results that you obtain numerically. Another approximation that we can do in two-dimensional problems is what is known as shape factor. In most place, in most problems where it is required to estimate the total heat rate and not necessarily the temperature profile. Remember that we said that we, once we get the temperature profile, we can differentiate it and get the heat rate. But suppose we have some approximations to get the heat rate directly. How do we do that? So for simple geometries, we can get the heat rate exactly. What are the simple geometries? There are uh, several geometries discussed in the uh, textbook table. We have just presented two of them. One is a sphere that is embedded in a medium. It's a semi-infinite medium, which means that in one direction, it is bounded by a top surface, whereas the other direction is a semi-infinite medium. This is a cylinder also in a semi-infinite medium. So what is the objective? We want to find, and each of them, this is at a temperature T1, and this is at a temperature T2. We want to find the total heat rate dq, which is an uh, integral over the area of this surface, in this case, the surface of the sphere, in this case, the surface of a cylinder. So integral over the area of this uh, objects of the flux. 
So flux is the local gradient. So K partial T by partial N is the local flux. So if we able to integrate this, we have got this. So in this, many of these cases, analytical solutions are possible. And it is uh, possible to obtain Q double prime. And from there, we can get Q prime. So once we solve this uh, Laplacian, uh, recognize that the Laplacian will be a the final solution, uh, Q, will be a function of dA, which is some geometry dependent parameters, and Q. Q has this uh, K as a parameter, and partial T, which is the total temperature gradient. So these are the only two, three parameters in the system. That is the thermal conductivity of the medium, the total temperature drop from T1 to T2, that's the second parameter, and some geometrical parameters. In the case of a sphere, there are just two geometrical parameters. One is the diameter of the sphere. Second is the distance from the surface to the center of the sphere. So these are geometrical parameters. It turns out that when you solve this exact equation, for many of the simple geometries, you can write the total heat flux to be S times K times delta T, where delta T is T2 minus T1. In some books, it's also written as T1 minus T2. So you just have to take it appropriately uh, which side the temp, uh, heat flux is uh, going. So if, it is, uh, if this is hotter, then heat flux is towards this. If this is colder, heat flux is from there to here. So in all these cases, it is possible to write the total heat flux as S into K into delta T, where K and delta T are the same parameters. And this entire geometry parameter can be written by a single number, which is a function of these geometrical parameters. In the case of spheres, we can write, it, it, it turns out the shape factor is simply 2 pi d divided by 1 minus d by 4z. So recognize that these are all purely geometric parameters. d is a diameter of the sphere. z is the distance from the top surface to the center. Similarly, in the case of a cylinder, we have two parameters. One is the uh, radius of the circle. Second is the length of the cylinder. And third is the distance. So in this case as well, you get an approximation 2 pi L by ln of 4 Z by T. Notice that in both the cases, the shape factor S has a unit of length. So it is D here, and these, uh, these get canceled out. Similarly, the denominator gets canceled out. You have a length unit there. So dimension of S is a length always that you can see from here as well. So here, this is uh, Q is Ka delta T, A and delta T by delta L. So A and delta T will get canceled and whatever is remaining will have a unit of length. In special cases, oh, so far we saw semi-infinite domain. So semi-infinite domain means you have a body which is embedded in a medium which is a finite distance from the top surface. On the other end, it is infinitely long. In the case of infinite, in all the region, all the directions, there is no end to the domain. The domain extends up to infinity. So in the case of uh, semi-infinite domains, we had two parameters. One is the set of parameters related to the shape of the object. Other is the location that is distance from the surface. In the case of infinite domains, we have only one parameter, which is the shape, uh, one set of parameters coming from the shape of the object. In this case, it is possible to simplify the expression and write what is known as a dimensionless heat rate. Instead of a shape factor, we define a dimensionless heat rate. So that comes about by defining what is called as a characteristic length. A characteristic length is defined by this way, where AS is the surface area of the object, 
by 4 pi. So recognize that uh, in the case of a sphere, your AS will be pi by 4 t square. So taking this LC and defining your dimensionless heat rate as Q double star is the actual Q, which you obtain by solving the differential equation divided by K AS delta T by LC. AS is the surface area, delta, these are all constants. K AS delta T, so these both are of the same unit. That's why this is dimensionless. So K A S delta T by L C is the uh, denominator which normalizes this. It turns out that in the case of a sphere, if we use this formula for the shape factor and then obtain this actual uh, heat divided by this normalizing factor, Q double star is one. So essentially Q star, Q double star denotes the uh, effective heat that will be emitted by a surface, by an object of a surface area equal to that of a sphere. So this is a very convenient formula. So in, in the case of a cylinder, it turns out that Q double star is slightly less than one. In other cases, it might be even smaller than one and so on. So this is a convenient way to represent uh, bodies in a infinite, uh, embedded in an infinite domain. So to summarize, we learned about uh, isotherms and the heat flow lines. They provide a useful and intuitive insight into the uh, nature of the temperature profile, which can be used to check our numerical equations. Secondly, we introduce geometry based shape factors, which provide a quick estimate of the heat rate. Thank you.